The electric field inside a charged ring. Here we'll calculate the electric field inside a charged ring. So here's a ring, and let's suppose it has a uniform linear charge density, lambda. Consider a location inside the ring, indicated by this dot. What's the electric field here, and where does it point? Well, first we can make a symmetry argument. The ring and the dot are symmetric across the dashed blue line, so the electric field has to point along the dashed line. If you told me why the field had to point on one side of the line, the same argument would work for the other side. So really, it doesn't point on either side, but the electric field must point along the line. If we drag this point around in a circle, the symmetry argument means that the E field must point in the radial direction. Now that could be radially inward, outward, or perhaps the electric field is zero. To find out, we'll have to calculate it. But first, with all the symmetry in the problem, let's just suppose that the point lies on a horizontal line with the center of the ring. So should the E field point radially inwards, outwards, or is it zero? To gain some intuition, let's draw in another line, shown here in green. Right now, let's assume lambda is positive, so we might expect the E field to point away from the ring. The part of the ring to the right of the green line creates a radially inward pointing electric field, that is, to the left, which we show here with arrows. But the part of the ring to the left of the green line contributes a radially outward, that is, to the right, component to the electric field. So the right portion of the ring is closer to the dot, and that's why we drew longer E-field vectors over here. But most of the ring is on the left side, which is why we drew more vectors pointing this way. So which side of the ring wins out in this tug of war? Which way does the E-field point? Well, for two-dimensional rings, if lambda is positive, the field points radially inward inside the ring. And if lambda is negative, the field points radially outwards. So we're going to prove both of these results here. So here's our game plan for finding the electric field. Let's consider a small segment of the ring. What's the electric field due to this segment? For now, we're assuming lambda is positive. If lambda is negative, you can turn all the vectors around and arrive at the same result. So from this segment, the E field points inward, this way. By symmetry, we know the E field created by the entire ring, and at this location, lies along this horizontal line. So we'll be considering the horizontal components of the electric field. And we'll integrate this horizontal component, shown here in red, as we swing the segment around the ring. Now the segment is left of the dot, so the horizontal component of the E field points to the right. But in general, the vector is shorter on this side, indicating the field is weaker, since the dot is closer to the other end of the ring. And now we're back on the right side where the field is stronger. So we want to integrate the horizontal component of the E field as we move around the ring. OK, so let's set up the integral. First, let's suppose that we're finding the electric field a distance little r from the center of the ring. Now let's consider a small segment at an arbitrary location on the ring. This segment contributes an electric field, which we'll call DE that points directly away from the segment. Now let's call the angle between the segment, the dot, and the horizontal axis, this angle here, let's call it phi. So if we want to find the horizontal component of DE, we know that this angle is also phi, and we can draw in a right triangle here. So the horizontal component is DE times the cosine of phi. Okay, we'll hold on to that little result, remembering that it's DE cosine phi that we'll be integrating. Now, a few more definitions. Let's suppose that the ring has radius big R, and that the angle the segment makes with the center of the ring and the horizontal axis, this angle here, is theta. So to integrate evenly around the ring, we'll define this small segment in pink as occupying an angular width of d theta, and the angular section is shown here in dark pink. So this means that the length of this segment is r d theta, and since the density, the charge density of the ring is lambda, the charge of this segment is lambda times its length, so that's lambda r d theta. And now let's just label a few more lengths here. Let's call the distance between the segment and the dot x. Also, the length of this line segment here is r cosine theta, since it's the adjacent side to the angle theta in this larger right triangle. And that means that this segment, which is this one minus that one, has length big r cosine theta minus little r. Now since we're trying to find DE cosine phi, but we're going to be integrating over the angle theta, we'll want to find cosine of phi in terms of big R, little r, and theta. Well, from this right triangle, cosine phi is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So it's big R cosine theta minus little r all over x. 
But what's x? x, the distance between the dot and the ring, depends on which segment of the ring we choose. So we're going to want to determine x in terms of, again, big R, little r, and theta. So, well, using this triangle, now shown in blue, we can do that using the law of cosines. The law of cosines says that when you have three sides of a triangle and one of the angles, then you can relate the side lengths to the cosine of that angle using this equation here. Well, here, the angle is theta. The side opposite that angle, c in the law of cosines equation, is x. And the other two sides are little r and big r. So after subbing those all in, we have an expression for x in terms of little r, big r, and theta. Taking the square root of both sides solves for x. And we can plug that expression for x into the cosine of phi. Great. So let's hold on to that result. We have an expression for the cosine of phi, but what about dE? Well, in general, the electric field at distance d from a point charge big Q is kq over d squared. We know that the charge is lambda r d theta, and the distance from the charge at which we're evaluating the field is x. And recall that we just found an expression for x squared using the law of cosines, and so we can plug that result in here. So now let's clear everything out. And we want to define an expression for dE cosine phi in terms of big R, little r, and theta. Well, we've done just that. By evaluating electric field, we found an expression for dE. And using some trigonometry and the law of cosines, we found an expression for cosine phi. Combining these gives us an equation for dE cosine phi. To simplify this expression, the first thing we can do is combine the denominators from these two fractions. The first is big R squared plus little r squared minus 2 big R little r cosine theta. The second denominator is the same thing, just with a square root. So combining them gives that expression to the 3 halves power. And now we'll do just a few more rearrangements here. Great. So that's our simplified expression for the horizontal component of the E field. Now recall the game plan. We wanted to integrate this component by considering the segments d theta around the ring. So we'll start our integration at theta equals zero, and we'll integrate up these components, shown by the red arrow, all the way around the ring until we return to the beginning at theta equals two pi radians. We're integrating this component, dE cosine phi, and these two angles, zero and two pi, represent the limits of our integration. So let's forget about the ring for a moment and focus on the math. Subbing in our expression for dE cosine phi into the integral gives this expression. And at this point, the physics takes a backseat to the math. In evaluating this integral, let's first make some simplifications. We're integrating over theta, and k, lambda, and big R are constants, so we can pull them out of the integral. Another series of simplifications we can make is factoring out big R from the numerator and denominator of this expression. So note that we can rewrite the numerator in this way, factoring out a big R. Multiplying what's inside the parentheses gives us big R cosine theta minus little r, which is what the numerator is. Similarly, inside the parentheses in the denominator, we can factor out a big R squared, and we can distribute the 3 halves power to both the big R squared, giving big R cubed, and to the term in the parentheses. And we can plug in these equivalent terms back into the fraction. Combining this big R with that big R gives big R squared, and we also have a big R cubed in the denominator. So combining all these terms gives us just a single big R in the denominator. And now let's define A as the ratio between little r and big R. If we do that, this expression becomes considerably nicer after we replace all the little r's over big r's, all of those fractions, with A. And here we haven't changed anything. We're just condensing the text a little bit after all these substitutions that we've been doing. Let's briefly discuss what this new variable a represents. Big R is the radius of the ring, and little r is the distance between the location whose electric field we're determining and the center of the ring. So if we were finding the E field at the ring center, little r would be zero, so a would be zero. Here, halfway along the radius of the ring, a is 0.5. And along the circumference of the ring, along the outside of it, a is one. And if we were actually outside the ring where little r exceeds big R, a is greater than one. Now, this integral is very tough to tackle analytically. 
So here we'll show the numerical results. We can make a graph of how this integral changes with a, the ratio that says how close you are to the center of the ring. Now when the integral is positive, in our example that means the electric field points radially inward, or to the left, uh, while uh, a negative value means the E field points radially outward, or to the right. At A equals zero, the very center of the ring, the E field is zero, since there's no net electric field in any direction due to the ring's symmetry. But as A increases, meaning we're inside the ring but getting closer to the circumference, the integral increases, indicating that the electric field is getting stronger, and it points inwards. The integral actually diverges up to infinity as we approach the ring. If you imagine getting really, really, really close to the edge of a ring and zoom in a lot, the ring starts to look like an infinite straight line. So we'd expect the electric field here to diverge as A approaches 1, similar to, similarly to how the field diverges as we approach an infinitely long charged wire. But on this graph, we also have space for when A is greater than 1, that is, when we're outside the ring. Looking at this integral, there's nothing that says A has to be less than 1. So similarly, at A just greater than 1, the field diverges, this time taking on a negative value, meaning the electric field is pointing outward. This makes sense, since now we're on the other side of the ring. And as we get farther away, the strength of the field diminishes. At very far distances, if we zoom out a lot, the ring might start to look like a point charge. So when A is much, much greater than 1, this, was, this result should match that of a point charge. And let's get some numbers out of this result while we have the graph here. What's the electric field at A equals 0 0.5? That is, halfway along the radius of the ring. Well, when A equals 0 0.5, this integral just happens to be equal to 2.167, according to the graph over here. So the E field has a strength of 2.167 times K lambda over big R, when A equals 0 0.5. From this, you can see that the integral is just a number like 2.167 in our example, and the k lambda over r contains all the units in this problem. So here we've proven that when the ring is uniformly and positively charged, the resulting electric field looks like this. If the ring is negatively charged, then all these arrows turn around. We can visualize our numerical result by drawing a dot at the origin. Now here's our graph again. As the dot moves radially outward, you can see the electric field the dot would feel both in the electric field diagram as well as in the graph. Inside the ring, the field points inwards, and it's strongest near the circumference. And once outside the ring, the field points radially outward. And once again, here's our analytical solution that gave us these results.